Well, today we're going to continue in the series we started uh, called A Bountiful Life. And what we're doing is we're taking one of the main metaphors that Jesus used in the New Testament. He talked about really a farming concept. He talked about sowing and reaping and growing. And so that's what we're talking about for five weeks. We've got today and two more weeks. Uh, the first week we talked about sowing, how important it is. You sow uh, what you sow, you reap what you sow, you reap more than you sow, and you reap after you sow. We learned about sowing and how important uh, that is. We're going to look at harvesting, okay? Uh, we, we looked at plowing, and Jesus used that as the idea of getting involved in the kingdom of God. And um, we, we learned that when Jesus said, anyone that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy or fit for the kingdom of God. Um, and that we learned that that word fit, you know, you, you've probably heard this preached before and they probably got it a little bit wrong, so you misunderstood. Uh, the truth is, when it says that if you look back, you're not fit, what that word means is usable. And so the concept is that when you are plowing, and that is working for God, living for God's kingdom, and you look back, your row is going to get crooked. You're not going to do what you're designed to do. And as a result, you are not usable. Think of it this way. I grew up working on my grandpa's farm. If I was plowing the fields and I was constantly looking back and I plowed up all the crops because I'm looking back. I'm not looking forward. You know what my grandpa would have said to me? Well, I can't say it in church, but nevertheless, he would say something along the line of, boy, you cannot do this anymore. Uh, you're not fit. You're not right. You're not going to be usable. And so in that concept... Uh, we're talking about being usable by looking forward. Now, we're going to be talking about waiting next week. Man, this is important. It's going to be a help. It's going to be a blessing. Don't miss it. And then last week, we'll talk about harvesting. But today, I want to talk to you about growing. Growing. The truth is, unless a crop grows, it's worthless. It's pointless. And the same way, in your Christian life, God wants you to grow. Now, he doesn't just want babies to grow. He doesn't want just new Christians to grow. They should grow. They need to grow. But he wants everyone, all of your life, to grow. That's why one of our value statements here is your next step is your most important step. That's the concept that Jesus was talking about, that you're always taking another step, that you're always growing. If you've been a Christian for 50 minutes or 50 years, you need to worry about taking your next step. It's always about growing spiritually. And I'll say it this way. If you do not grow spiritually, it's likely you're not even saved. Because if your spiritual life is not growing, if you're not and once again, I'm not saying that everybody's Billy Graham, okay? But what I'm saying is this. God designed you to grow. You, and he uses this metaphor, and I love the metaphors that Jesus uses in teaching us about the kingdom of God, teaching us about how to live for God, okay? And so this is a message today you've probably never heard talked about in this way, but I want to talk to you today about how you can grow as a Christian and, and looking at it in a way that will make sense to you, I believe, but it's also vital for your Christian life. Well, God speaks to us through his word. And I want to show you today that without the word of God, it's impossible as a Christian to grow. Now, the truth is, our universe is a word-based universe. Now, you may not understand that fully. Let me try to explain it briefly. Uh, the Bible says in Genesis 1, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters, giving us the idea that in creation, uh, that God formed that creation, that God grew that creation. Now, God never makes a mistake. And I love that in Genesis 1, where everything began, that God tells us about creation. Now, does, is Genesis 1 a science book? No. But it is, what I would say, ahead of science. We can learn from God's Word what we can't always learn from science, okay? Now, I want you to get what God said in the Word of God, what was recorded in the Holy Scripture in Genesis 1. Ten times in this story of creation, ten times, you know what the little phrase is? And God said. Fifteen times God spoke in Genesis 1 alone. Fifteen times God spoke to this creation. He spoke to it so that it could exist. The interesting thing is, if you look at it, um, the things that we see that God created, they always need the things that God did to produce them. Let me explain Fish, you know what the Bible says, and God said, let the waters bring forth the fish. Now, here's the thing. Fish cannot live without water. He said to the birds, he said to the air, bring forth the fowls, the flying things. And a bird cannot fly without the atmosphere, without the air. This is where they're from. This is what God spoke to and they existed. The animals, it said, let the earth bring forth. Okay? So they cannot exist. A deer cannot exist in the air. A deer cannot exist in the ocean. They must have the land. Okay? And so everything that God created came from something that it is necessary for it to sustain life. Now, in Genesis... Chapter 1 and 2, the Bible gives us the idea that God did not just speak to man, but that he formed him with his hands. Now, what do we learn from that? We learn that man, just like a fish can exist without the sea or without the water, just like a bird cannot exist, cannot fly without the air, just like an animal cannot exist without the earth and what it produces, in the same way, human beings cannot exist, cannot function fully apart from the Word of God. Now, I'm not suggesting that if you don't ever read the Bible, that you can't live, that you can't get up and breathe and go to work and eat food. I'm not suggesting that. But you cannot function the way God designed you to function. Once again, a bird can live if it doesn't ever fly, we go to places where they have birds caged. We see that they're in zoos or they're in some kind of preserve. And those birds, can they live? Yes. But that's not how they were designed to live. A bird was designed to be able to fly. Maybe except for an ostrich. But nevertheless, you know what I'm saying. And, and, and here's the point. Can you live life without God speaking to you? Can you live life apart from God's word? Well, you can. I mean, you can get up and you can go to work and you can have a family and you can go to the bank and you can pay your bills and you can go out to eat. But what you cannot do is live a bountiful life. Once again, we're talking about discovering how or what God made you for. Why are you here? And the truth is, we must have God's Word in our life to grow, to function in the way that God designed us to function. Let me take it a step further. Uh, did you know that scientists have discovered that our universe seems to be dependent upon words and codes just simply to exist? DNA is the most complex, listen, this is the word that scientists use, language in the history of the world. It 
literally is a word-based universe that we live in. They say that proteins and that molecules, it seems like that they exist with words or codes, and without those words or codes, we would not exist. We would not even be able to live or breathe. Now, for, uh, John chapter 1, remember the Gospel of John was written much after Genesis. Genesis was written by Moses before Jesus came to this earth in the New Testament. Jesus was here, and John, one of his disciples, he wrote this, reflecting his understanding of what God says about our needing the Word of God. Listen to what John wrote in John chapter 1. He said, in the beginning... That sounds like Genesis, doesn't it? In the beginning was the Word. He got all the way to it. He said, look, more important than light, more important than earth, more important than animals, more important than anything, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Do you get the idea that we're word-based? That without the word, that we can't exist? Let me take even a step further. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. We've seen what God said in Genesis 1. We've seen what was reiterated in John's gospel, chapter 1. Listen to what the book of Hebrews says. Chapter 1. Verse 1 to 3, long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke, there's that word again, God spoke to our fathers, how did he do it? By the prophets. But in these last days, he's talking about since Jesus came, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So, So get the picture. Without the Word of God, the universe would not exist. DNA could not be possible. Molecules could not be possible. Proteins could not be possible. None of this is possible without God's Word. God spoke it, and and, uh, the air formed birds. God spoke it, and the water formed fish. God spoke it, and the earth brought forth livestock and living animals. And he says, in the last day, in these days... The most important thing that you need to understand about your life is the Word, capital W, the Word, the Logos. Jesus is the Word of God. He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom He also created the world. And then get this, it's almost like, I love these little add-ons that you read in Scripture. It's almost like, Oh, yeah, and this too, you know? It's almost like an afterthought, almost like God is so big and so important and he's so powerful that I don't even really need to say that, but just in case, and he said, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Now, Now, get this, not only, not only do we not exist, are we not able to be created Are we not able to live without God speaking it, without God willing it, without the word of God? He said that he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Now, I've spent a long time trying to set this up. Because what I'm going to read to you today is a parable that most of you have heard before. And I want you to see it in a new light. Understanding how the Word of God is necessary to help us grow, no matter if we've been a Christian for five minutes or 50 years, okay? I, as a pastor, I, as a Christian, need the Word of God. I need it in my life. You know what I do? I read the Bible. I listen to the Bible. Every time I get in my car going somewhere, I'll turn it on and play it. You know what? In addition to the other things, and this is why I want to show you how 
you can go through the Word of God. You may not think you can. You may not like to read. You may have difficulty comprehending what you read. Some people have dyslexia, and it's hard for them to read. But you know what everyone in this room can do? You can listen to the Word of God. You know what the Bible says in Romans? So then faith comes by reading. Oh, wait, wait. That's not what it said, is it? Faith comes by speaking. No, that's not what it said. It said, faith comes by hearing. Hearing. And the reason I think it was written that way, because when it was written, shortly after Jesus resurrected, you know that a lot of people could not read. A lot of people, the only way they got the intake of the Word of God that they needed was by hearing. Hearing is no less important today than it was then. You need to hear the Word of God. You need to hear it preached. You need to hear it taught. You need to hear it explained. And then if you can read, you need to read it as well. But at the very least, you need to hear God's Word. Why? Because it's necessary to grow. It's necessary for us to be where we need to be. So let's read Matthew chapter 13. Um, this is a parable that you're familiar with. It's the parable of the sower and the seed. And the same day Jesus went out of his house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered to him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path. Um, some translations read the wayside. I think that's very descriptive because seed that does not get to the right prepared heart, it's like the wayside. Some fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fall on rocky ground and where they didn't have much soil. And immediately they sprang up and since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked them. And other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then his disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them... It has not been given, and you need to pay attention to what was just read, okay? Because he's talking about the preparation of the heart. And he's talking about there are some people that have a heart to receive what God said, and there are others that don't have, as Jesus said, ears to hear, okay? So this is very important. And he said, to you has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but them has not been given. For to one who has, the one who has, more will be given. Man, that, that's interesting, isn't it? Because we tend to think that, well, the one who has, he's got enough. That's what Jesus said. To the one who is receiving the word of God, more will be given. But... To the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. Let me ask you a question. Do you like abundance? Oh, I love abundance. My mom said when I was little, and she was feeding me. You know how moms will say to little kids, oh, you, that's too much. You can't have that. My mom said when I was little, and she was dipping my food, I'd say, Mama, give me too much. Give me too much. And you know what I think Jesus is saying here? That when it comes to receiving from the Spirit of God, when it comes to receiving the Word of God, you can ask God, God, give me too much. I want abundance. I want overflow. That's what he's saying. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Oh, my. Now, what does that mean? And I really do believe this. There are people that have received the Word of God. And they've been in church, and they've heard the Word of God taught, they've read the Word of God, they've even served God, but their soil of their heart began to be rocky, or it began to be thorny. 
and, and the thorny ground, you know what it said? The cares and the pleasures and the riches of this world choked out their fruitfulness. And you know what happens? When we get a heart that has thorns, we began to lose what we had. And I know people, oh, I hate this. I know people that used to be faithful, that used to have a, a, a dynamic relationship with God. And the thorns of their heart began to choke out the word of God. And you know what happened? Before long, they lost what they had. I've seen it happen. As a pastor, I've seen it happen so many times. People that at one time were faithful and they served and they gave and they, man, it was just like everything in their life was about that relationship with God. And today, I could point you to their house. Some of them are not very far from here. I could tell you about the hundreds of people that used to be receptive to the Word of God. And they were just getting more and more, and they were growing, and it was great. But now it seems like what they had was taken away. People that used to believe, it's not that they don't believe in God, it's not that they don't believe in Jesus, it's not that they're not saved. But what's happened is they've put their hand to the plow, and they look back. What does that mean? Well, they're not usable. They're not in a position where they are hearing the Word of God. And, and I believe this metaphor continues in our Christian life. I, the pastor that I grew up under, old country guy, and I love the little simple country sayings he used to have. He said this, and you'll, you'll remember this, talking about being called by God to serve God, you know, the idea of hearing the voice of God. Here's what he said. The reason some of you don't get called to do anything is because you ain't within calling distance. Now, chew on that. And the reason that some, and this is exactly what Jesus is saying. There are some that they had, and it seems like what they did have is being taken away. Why? They ain't within calling distance. They were, but now... They're not. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see. Does that not describe a lot of people in our culture today? They can see, but they can't see spiritually. Okay? Seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. Once again, there's the heart. There's the preparation of the heart. He's talking about the heart being the receptacle for the Word of God in order to grow. You cannot grow a crop without good soil. So he's saying. You can't grow a crop when the seed falls by the wayside. You cannot grow a crop when seed falls on a stony ground. You cannot grow a crop when the seed falls on thorny ground. That's what he's saying. Their hearts become, become dull. And with their ears, they can barely hear. And their eyes, they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn. So he's saying. Their heart has got to be prepared. And unless they do that, they'll never turn. And I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Now, I know that I talk in outlines when it comes to preaching God's Word. But let me just give you a couple things, and we're wrapping this up. There are five principles that help us understand what he's saying. The seed is the Word of God. Okay, um, the soil is the heart. Jesus is the one who sows, and he wants to speak to you. Do you get the idea from this that Jesus puts a high priority on your receiving the word of God? You get it? Okay. God's word won't help us if we don't have receptive hearts. You can have hard so a heart like hard soil by the wayside, the roadside, won't grow. You can have a heart that doesn't have much depth. 
it's stony ground. And, and I love how Jesus said it. Immediately it sprang up. There are a lot of Christians like that. It's an emotional thing. Now, there's nothing wrong with emotions. I love emotions. I'm glad God gave us emotions. He created them. But some people, that's as deep as they get. Okay? It gets in their emotions, but never in their head. Never in their will. Okay? And so, in order to overcome that, you've got to receive the Word of God. That's what he's saying. Uh, so, if you have thorny ground or stony ground, uh, the Word of God's not going to help you. You can ha- hear it preached, and it won't help you at all if you don't have a receptive heart. And the devil's going to do everything to keep your heart from being receptive. That's what we learn from this. Now, how can you grow from the Word of God? How do you do it? Well, I believe you got to reject the lies of the enemy. Do you know the devil's going to lie to you? The Bible calls him a liar. And the father of lies. In fact, what that means is... Not only is he a liar, he's the one that started lying. It didn't exist before him. He's the father of lies. Why would you believe what he says? Now, sometimes we don't hear because of having a dull heart. That's the roadside. You have heart that's dull. Uh, Luke 8, 18, therefore take heed how you hear. Important. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And whoever does not have, even that which he seems to have will be taken away from him. Not suggesting that uh, God doesn't want you to hear and understand the word of God. He's saying when your heart gets hard, what's going to happen is it's going to be like you never even received it eventually. That's what he's saying. That's, that's hard, isn't it? So what's the heart? A hard or dull heart, the roadside. A shallow heart, that's the rocky soil. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the person without the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. That makes sense, right? If you don't have the Spirit of God in you, you're not going to understand it. You're not going to receive it. Um, But considers them foolishness. Do you know how many people that don't know Jesus that have rejected the Word of God that I know, and you probably know a lot of them too, They think the Word of God's foolish. Why? Because they don't receive it through the Spirit of God. And they can't understand them because they're only discerned through the Spirit. That's what he's saying. So don't reject the Spirit. Don't have a dull, hard heart. Don't have a shallow heart. Don't have a crowded heart. That's the thorny soil. Man, do you ever get a crowded heart? I do. I mean, the cares and the pleasures, and the riches of this world. Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus say those things were sin? No, he did not. Because those are things necessary for living. The cares of this life. You got to eat. You got to have a place to sleep. You got to have clothes to wear. Therefore, unless you're independently wealthy because somebody gave you a bunch of money and you had a rich uncle that died and left you millions of dollars, you're going to have to work. Is there anything wrong with working? No, it's actually a command by God. In Genesis. And by the way, don't confuse the call to work with the uh, curse of sin. Because the call to work came before Adam and Eve ever sinned. Did you know that? Work is to be a blessing. Okay? So, um, the fact is, paying your bills, earning a living, the pleasures of this world. Now, that can mean sinful pleasures, but... Most likely that's not what it means because in the context he's talking about living a normal life. And so let me ask you a question. Anything wrong with the sunset? Oh, I love to watch sunset. Actually, I like watching sunrise too. Um, Anything wrong with the beach? Oh, I love the beach. Now, I don't like laying in the sun, okay? Uh, That's for people that are preparing for skin cancer, okay? So I don't particularly care to do that. I love being in the sun. I love working, walking, running, whatever. I love being outside. Anything wrong with that? No, that's God's creation. Beautiful. Pleasures. Let me ask you a question. Anybody here like a good meal? Oh, I love a good meal. Don't you? Okay. Yeah, somebody raising your hand. All right. I can talk about the Bible all day and you don't respond. I talk about food. You're like, oh, yeah, I'm with you, brother. There we go. I'm just kidding. (laughs) 
But the point is not that those things are bad. The point is, if you're not careful, those things will crowd out God in your life. You'll just say, well, I, I would go, but I don't have time. I would go to church, but, man, it's so far. We say it's too much, it's too far, it costs too whatever. And God says, no, don't have a crowded heart. So you got to consistently receive the truth of God's Word. This is what he's saying. Reject the lies of the enemy, consistently receive the truth of God's Word, and when you do that, you begin to grow. You receive more light and wisdom. You, God reveals himself and his will, and your heart begins to change. Do you know, I've been reading the Bible since I was 10 years old, okay? And uh, I don't even know how many times I've read it through. I know it's over 40, from cover to cover. And I've read parts of it hundreds and hundreds of times, okay? Um, memorized hundreds and hundreds of verses. And what is the point? That, you know what, the more I read it, the more I ask God to reveal it to me, you know what happens? He reveals it. I know more about the Bible now than I used to. Why is that? Because I'm some scholar? No. It's because the Holy Spirit wants me, listen, to grow. And the more I grow, the more wisdom I get. Now, I'm not suggesting that I never make a mistake. Because I do. But you know what I know for sure? Is that the more I receive the word of God, the more it changes me. And I've been reading it for a long time. I've read it probably more than most people. In fact, I know more than most people. Uh, parts of it I've read, like I said, hundreds and hundreds of times. And so the question is this. If you don't get the word of God into your life, will your heart change? The answer is yes, but not for the good. It will be a challenge for you if you don't get the word of God into your life to grow. Well, that all comes down to this. How do, how do you respond to this? Well, here's the application. This is what you leave with. Make a plan. You know what I've learned? It's when I make plans for things. They normally happen. Uh, you know, when it comes to working out and stuff like that, if I don't make a plan, I don't do it. If I don't have a strategy, I won't do it. You're the same, probably. Whether it's diet, whether it's reading, whether it's getting education, it doesn't matter what it is. You've got to get a plan or you're not going to stick with it. And the same way, did you know that God's Word gives us a plan? Let me read it to you. Deuteronomy chapter 6, God was talking to the Israelites. Here's what he said. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. That's what it starts out with. God is transcendent. God is singular. God is large and in charge. He is omnipotent, all-powerful. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. God, God, so he's saying, he's the Lord. He's our God. He's one. Okay. And here's our response. That's what God is. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Now, that is easier said than actually defined. Because I've talked to a lot of people that say they love God, but their life doesn't back it up. Their actions don't reflect that. And then he goes on to tell us how to do this. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart, okay? And you shall repeat them diligently to your sons and speak of them. Notice what he's saying. He says, speak of them in your house. When you walk on the road, if we updated it to 21st century, we'd say in your car, going where you're going, when you're headed somewhere, when you, lie, when, uh, when you lie down, in other words, when you go to bed, when you get up, when you get up in the morning to go to work or go about your day, he said, you shall also tie them as a sign on your hand. And he said, we are to put them as frontlets on your forehead. That's what the Hebrews called phylacteries. 
What does that mean? They would have a little box that they would bind around their hand. You know what it had? It had Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. You shall hear always of the Lord is our God, the Lord is the one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. They would carry that scripture on their hand. Why? Because your hand is what you do, your task. They would tie it with a leather thong around their, if you ever see uh, Hasidic Jews today, uh, they will still do that. They'll have a little box on their hand, a little box on their forehead. It looks kind of funny, but what they're doing is they're saying, I am allowing God's word to change everything in my life. I am following what it said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. He said, you shall write them as a sign on, on your hand, and they shall be as frontless on your forehead, and you shall also write them, notice, not just in what you do, not just how you think, you'll put them on the doorposts of your house and your gates. What does that mean? It's where you live. So you got to consistently take in Scripture through reading and hearing. That's what he's saying. Read the Bible. Listen to it being taught. The word hear there in Deuteronomy 6 means to listen with the intention of obeying. Now I can hear something. Just like my old pastor said, the reason some of you don't ever get called to do anything, you ain't within calling distance. But you ever let your mama, when you're a kid, hey, hey, stop doing that. Hey, hey, Richie, come in here. You need to get something to eat. And I heard her, but I pretended like I didn't. Wait, where were you, boy? I called you. I didn't hear you, mama. You know what? My heart heard, but I didn't intend to obey. Why? Well, I want to do my own thing. And this is what the Bible says that you and I must not do. In other words, we are to hear with the intention of obeying. Hey, Richie, come in for supper. Okay, mama, I'm coming. Hey, Richie, quit playing in the mud. You're going to get my carpet dirty when you come in. Okay, Mama, I'll stop. Hey, Richie, if I had the heart that was right, you know what I would do? I would hear, and my plan was to obey. And this is what God says to you and me. We must hear with the intention of obeying. Now, I've gone a little bit longer, but let me close with a couple of scriptures. Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me and I'll answer you and I'll tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. You want to know what to do? You want to know what decision to make? Read the word of God. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You want direction in life? Get the word of God. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Jesus says, if you're saved, if you're really a Christian, you're going to hear the voice of Jesus. The voice, we know that he is the word. When you hear the word, it's going to change you. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living. You ever have this thought that sometimes when I read the Bible, it's not me reading the Bible, it's the Bible reading me. You, you ever do that? Okay. Look, look at what he said. It's biblical. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, I know that sounds a little bit violent, but he's just using this. It's like a scalpel. And it will cut away the things that don't need to be in your life. He says, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit. You know what those two things are? The soul, that's the human part of you. You, you. you are a soul. You're a human being. you got a mind. you got emotions. And you got a will. That's who you are. Okay, it's not your body. Uh, it sometimes can refer to body. But it's the, your being. It's what it is. Your essence. And notice what he said. The word of God can divide even the soul and the spirit. What is the spirit? It's the spiritual part of you that communicates with God. 
Now, God doesn't want your soul and your spirit to be separate. He wants your soul. Listen, I'm getting ready to give you something good. He wants your soul to be in subjection to your spirit. Now, we often get it reversed. You ever let your soul be in charge of your spirit? The natural desires overcome the spiritual needs in your life? Oh, I don't feel like doing that. Oh, I don't want to do that. And the soul dominates the spirit. But here's what he said. When you read the word of God, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it will pierce even to the division of soul and spirit. What does that mean? It means that God will let you be in a position where you'll make the right choice when you have a heart that receives the living word of God. He said... It will divide even the joints and marrows, the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. (laughs) God's word will help you know what is right and what is wrong. And then finally, Revelation 3.20, behold, this is Jesus. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup. And this is from the New King James Version. No, it's actually the Old King James. And I love that. I, I love that word, sup. Not like when you're greeting another teenage boy. Sup, man, hey. (laughs) Sup, we get the word supper from it. I don't know about you, but I love supper. And and this, this culture, when this was written, somewhere between 80 and 90 A.D., first century, um, the idea that was being conveyed here is that Supper, which was the most important day of the meal, when the family gathered around us and everybody was together, he said, I'll come in and I'll have supper with you. I will sup with you and you with me. And so the the, the idea is this. When you get the word of God, the living word of God, and you allow it into you, what's going to happen? Jesus is going to sup with you. Now, you ever just have to have fast food? Ugh. It makes your stomach feel bad, especially as you get older, okay? I mean, you don't, you don't feel good, you get ingestion, you have regret. I mean, McDonald's is wonderful going down, but once it gets down, it's awful. You know what I'm saying? Okay? But you get you a good supper. You get something that was well-prepared that is good for you, that is delicious, that you're with your family, and you're at peace. You know what you're doing? You're supping. This is what Jesus said. You want that relationship? You want that peace in your life? You want that stuff to happen, that that joy, that decompression, that um, releasing of stress at the end of the day, that time with family, that which you live for, that which builds you up. He said, I'm knocking. I used to use this as a salvation verse, but it's really to Christians. And you know what Jesus is saying? I'm standing at the door. Actually, he's talking about the door of the church. But to you and me, we are the church. Okay, listen. He says, I'm knocking at the door. I want to come in, but I'm not going to force my way in. But if you will open the door, I'll come in. Oh, Jesus doesn't just come in, but he has supper with us. He restores us. He blesses us. He fills us. He gives us peace. Heavenly Father, help us to have hearts that are willing to receive the word of God. Jesus, just like you said, we have a heart. Sometimes the seed of the Word of God goes by the wayside and we reject it. Sometimes we have a shallow heart. Sometimes we have a crowded heart. There's no room for it with all the other cares of this world. But sometimes we can have good soil and we'll bear fruit. God, help us today to do just that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, 
went a little long today, uh, longer than normal, but uh, anyway, I appreciate you not getting up and leaving, so, uh, but we're uh, going to have our offering. Uh, I'll ask our ushers to come at this time, and remember, you can give in the offering, but make sure that you put your next step card in if you're new, or if you um, have a prayer request, or whatever, you can use that uh, and put that in there while they're passing that, okay? Uh, let me say this, if you are in need of prayer, we're going to have somebody with our prayer team over here. They'll be right here by this table. And uh, so don't, don't leave. If you need to pray with somebody, before you leave, come and pray, all right? And um, so uh, I think Wendy's going to be over here. Wendy, are you going to be up here? Okay. Uh, Wendy is a prayer warrior. Okay, I love it. She's she kind of directs our prayer time on Wednesdays at noon. And not only do we pray and have communion, such a beautiful, sweet time, but we also have an amazing lunch afterwards. So uh, now I'm not going to be carnal and say I like the lunch better than I like the prayer time because I love prayer time, okay? But I really like the lunch too, okay? So, but anyway, so but she'll be here to pray with you if you have a spiritual need. If you want to be saved. Uh, if you have a prayer request of some kind, please come by. No matter what it is, you say, I want to pray about my kid. I want to pray about my job. I want to pray about my neighbor who's so mean and he blows his grass over on my drop. doesn't matter what it is, okay? You can come and pray, okay? God bless you. I love you. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, we'll see you. Remember, next Sunday, 930 and 11, and then the Sunday after that, one service at 1030. God bless you. See you next week.